back in our Father's Word, the first book of Timothy. You know, Timothy being a pastoral letter, Timothy was about 13 years old when Paul first came by, visiting him, his mother Eunice, and his grandmother Lois. And uh, seven years later now, he comes back, and Timothy's a grown man. So he's writing him this pastoral letter telling him how a church should act and react and so forth. So it, it is doctrinal and pastoral and quite, a, quite a, uh, a lot of information telling us as Christians how to get along with, um, within the body itself. So having said that, the last chapter we, we were told of the mystery of Christ. And that mystery, of course, was from the foundation of this world. And that prepared you for this fourth chapter, which, um, which uh, you'll understand, self-explanatory. Chapter 4, verse 1, the word of wisdom from our Father, and it reads, Now the Spirit, naturally that's the Holy Spirit, speaketh expressedly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. The, the, the word depart in the Greek is apostasy. The great apostasy will transpire. And naturally, when, when you have people that begin to listen too much to traditions of men, that makes void the word of God chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And what, what he's telling Timothy here is, um, I want you to, in the latter times, teach that people should expect this. And you know, it is really true. When you look at this world today, and when you see so many people doing bad things and calling it good, spiritual wars and blowing up little children, innocence, you know something is far wrong. Somebody's being led off the path expressively as the Holy Spirit would speak, bringing truth um, to all mankind. So these seducing spirits, don't, don't think for a moment there are evil spirits in the earth. Uh, Satan, we have the Holy Spirit, and for every negative there is a positive. God also allows the evil spirit, but he gave us power over them. In Christ's name, you can order them out of your life. You don't have to put up with it. So you make a stand, you stand strong. But there are, I mean, people that will lead you astray if you listen to them. Well, how can I tell the difference? Well, are they teaching God's word or man's word? That's pretty easy to determine. Verse 2, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. You know, um, many people lose uh, the meaning of being seared, like you would sear a weapon before we had all the antibiotics and everything else. Many times you would, if you were in the field, you would have to sear a bad wound to stop the bleeding and everything else. But unfortunately, when you do that, it kills every nerve in that area. you got no feeling there any longer. And what he's saying here is your very conscience your thought process is seared with a hot iron. There's no feeling there. There's, there's uh, no conscience. You have no compassion. And um, certainly, Satan always grant, gains ground when people have no compassion. Always the mark of a Christian, especially one of God's elect, is they have compassion on people. They care. Verse 3. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Now, many times people have difficulty reading. Never let anybody, well, now, well, there are some groups that uh, if you're a divorcee, you cannot remarry. Well, it shows their ignorance of God's word. Number one, if you understand the law of our Father's Word, there are reasons for divorce. And those reasons well recorded. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 
And then, have you ever read uh, Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 8? God is a divorcee. He divorced Israel. Give her, I mean, wrote her out a bill of divorcement. You can read it for yourself. Jeremiah 3, verse 8. But Christ forgives. And it is true, if you do not repent, you should not remarry. But if you repent of all your sins, and God washes you white as snow, and forgives you, you're a new person. Now, th this has to do with, there are biblical reasons for divorce, in that you can remarry. Don't ever let anyone take that away from you, and don't ever let anyone judge you on that. Because, why? Well, by God's word. Go by God's word, not traditions of men. Some, some people will make second-class citizens out of divorcees. That is not fair, and it is not right. Make them sit at the back of the church. How, how unfair can you be to teach a forgiving Christ? The fact that he forgives all sins, paid an awesome price on the cross. To, to pay for sins on repentance. And then to say he doesn't have the power to do that. Now, there's a great deal more in that particular verse that you've got to be real careful. Commanding to abstain from meats. You shouldn't eat this or you shouldn't eat that. But, but that's not what it says. It says, which God hath created to be received. Don't let anyone judge you on that. God didn't create everything to be received. God made basically two classes of animal, and bird and fish. Scavengers don't eat. Um, and otherwise, they're clean. So, and it is clean food. So, uh, no way have bodies changed since, you, since the beginning of time. Still the same flesh bodies, generation to generation. Same health laws. God makes it very clear in Leviticus chapter 11 what you should and shouldn't eat. Now, this, this um, eating scavengers is, is not a sin to hell. It's a sin to your health. If you want to be healthy, you want to eat God's way. That's, that's why, why you pay attention to what your father... He created these bodies. He sent this letter of instructions along on how to keep them healthy and perking right along and doing pretty good, though we live in a polluted world. So uh, what, this is, what do you mean then with a scavenger? Okay, let's take... You've got a little fish that's a sucker, called a sucker. He goes around on the bottom of everything and eats all the droppings and dead animals and all the germs and diseases, and he, he cleans the pond. He's a good animal for what he was created for. He keeps disease away from the good fish. Okay. But you don't eat one of them. That's like taking your dirty air conditioner filter that's filtered your house and make you a cup of tea out of it. Okay. Likewise, what is a great stretch for many people is pork, then. Naturally, Leviticus says, of the pork you shall not eat. Why? Well, it has no sweat glands, except for just one or two in its nose. Well, where does the poison... You know, a human being, you've got sweat glands. If you get sick, you get a fever, and you sweat the poison out of your system. That's the way God made us. A, por a porky... He's created to cleanse the earth, and therefore he has no sweat glands, and therefore the poisons are stored in his fat. Naturally, that's why God said, hey, don't eat them. They will make you sick. Okay, And you, you go with that that has the split hoof and choose its could. But th those are God's health laws. And many are going to say, well, brother, you're just out of touch. Because Peter, in Acts chapter 10, was told by God when he brought three sheets down filled with scavengers and told Peter to eat, that he cleansed them. You would be a poor student of God's word if you felt that from that point. Just as those sheets were coming down from heaven and God was telling Peter to eat as he was on top of the house praying, Cornelius' people were at the front gate asking that Peter would come and teach them that they loved the Lord Jesus Christ. They were Gentiles. 
called unclean or common before this time. It was not legal for one that served God to eat even with a, a Gentile, a commoner. God is doing a little lesson here concerning the scavengers with people. What did he say there? Let's, what was the whole message of that? If you think that was what it was, you find the answer in the 28th chapter. After the sheep went up three times, Peter, he still said, I'm not going to eat that stuff. Then finally Cornelius' people show up and, and speak of the angel that sent them here sooner or later. And then Peter states in the 28th verse, and this is the answer. And he said unto them, You know how that it is not, it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company, just to socialize, or come unto one of another nation, that's, that's ethnicity, where our word ethnicity, ethnics, comes from. But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. And not, not animals. We're not talking about something to eat. God was making a point to Peter that you don't call uh, anyone. And uh, allos in the Greek is different. Pool is a race or kindred. You do not call them common, whoever they are. If they love the Lord Jesus Christ, they're a Christian. Okay, That's what that was all about. It was not cleansing food. So back again to the fourth chapter. Don't let anyone judge you in marriage or don't let anyone judge you in eating meats that God created to be received. And again, I'll give you the key. All you got to do is read Leviticus 11 and it'll give the list there that you should and shouldn't eat if you want to be healthy. So um, there we, it's, it's too bad that people... Um, miss, do not teach God's word of health and understanding as well as spiritual. Explicitly, he says in verse 1, teach this. Now, here again is where it throws a lot of people. They take this fourth verse. Verse 4, let's read it. For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. And people will say, well, see right there, God made it possible that every creature is good. Didn't say good to eat. Good for the purpose God created it for. Okay. That's, that is what the subject is. Every creature that's being one created of God is good. God doesn't create bad stuff. He created bad stuff for you to eat. But you see, that bad stuff that you're not supposed to eat keeps disease off of humanity. It cleanses the world. That's what it was created for, and that is good. For the purpose God created it, that's good. Now, this is something everybody must make their own mind up about and, uh, and choose their own path. And, but uh, as a teacher of God's Word and understanding the manuscripts, I'm going to teach it the way it's written on every quarter. If you want to be healthy, God created these bodies. He sent this book of instructions on how to handle them. You know, a lot of people, if they get some big uh, house object that must be put together, they were sent a bill of instructions on steps to use, and they throw that away and start throwing stuff together, and they end up with a bunch of leftovers, and that's the way they do their own life. They don't read this letter of instructions on how to keep the body healthy and how to be pleasing to Almighty God whereby you receive His blessings. That's important. So, there you have it. Uh, always remember Acts chapter 10, verse 28, when you read that verse. Uh, verse 5, let's continue on. For it is sanctified by the Word of God and prayer. In other words, by the Word of God and prayer and study of the Word, you know what is and what isn't. Verse 6. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up, nourished up 
in the words of faith and of good doctrine whereunto thou hast attained. In other words, if you will stick with this, if you will stand by it, if your character will not bend one way or the other, never, you, know, you do not teach God's word to offend anyone, but to correct, to bring help, to bring the good news, to bring the letter from God, and never make any apology for it. Because it is your Heavenly Father's Word. And His doctrine, you want to be a good minister, you want to be one that is able to plant seeds to your neighbors and so on and so forth, go by God's Word. It makes you a good citizen. It, it makes you out, uh, stand out in the community. Your own dignity and your reputation is helped there. Verse 7, But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Now, you know, women sure get a bad rap sometimes by interpreters without explaining the full thing. You know, I'm, I'm familiar with old wives' fables, and I'm familiar with old husbands' fables also. There's a difference. If you listen to the man's fables, do you know they grow and get bigger and bigger and bigger? Women's fables usually pretty well, the old wives they pretty well stay the same. But men's, they grow and get greatness to them, you know. So, uh, always document things. It's real easy to document them in the Word of God and find out what saith the Father. For He's the one that made these things, knows how to get along, and what He expects from us if you want His blessings, okay. Uh, verse 8, for bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Now, uh, bodily exercise is fantastic. It keeps your body healthy, uh, but compared to exercising your mind in the Father's Word, makes you much stronger. It gives you character. It, it gives you knowledge and wisdom and understanding. It gives you the doctrine of Almighty God, whereby you can attain freedoms from doctrines, freedoms from traditions of men that will bind you and make prisoners out of you by false teaching. You know, Learn the truth, and the truth will set you free from crackpots, okay, from false teachers, from fables, when you have the actual Word of God in His gentleness and in His kindness. God's Word is always gentle when it should be gentle, and it's firm when it should be firm, and it is certainly corrective when you have to practice tough love. It's all part of God's Word to its completeness. Verse 9, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. It's just, it's just good. Exercise your mind. Keep it working. Verse 10, for therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men. How many was that again? all men, especially of those that believe. When you believe, you automatically, God so loved this world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whomsoever would believe upon him would not perish, but have eternal life. That word eternal is, it means exactly that. God is not the God of the dead. In other words, you exist from the first earth age through this one and the one to come. God is not the God of the dead. Satan isn't even dead yet. I think if you've lived very long, you can document that. <clears throat> but he will at the end of that great 20th chapter of the great book of Revelation. Verse 11. These things command and teach. <clears throat> In other words, you hold, excuse me, you hold a firm line, and this is what you teach. And you know something? If you teach and practice God's Word, you're going to have God's blessings. You know, some people say, well, God never does anything for me. I wonder why. Well, I can tell you. 
Do you ever read his letter? Do you ever live by it? Kind of, you know, at least, I, I know we're not perfect, and I know we all fall short. But if you make a good effort, God's going to bring you happiness. God's going to bless your life. And, um, and I believe that many people have a destiny and a purpose, as it is written in this great word of God's election. And they have duties to do, and they've known since there was a child there was more to God's word than they had been taught. And they hang in there, and they let build that character. They exercise that mind, and they absorb that truth. And they're not afraid to share it. Okay. Verse 12. Let no man despise thy youth. Now, Timothy was only about, what, 20 or 21. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, well, how can you do that in word? You learn it. You exercise your mind in it. Then you're ready. Timothy was. He had two good teachers besides Paul. He had, he had Eunice and he had Lois, his mother and grandmother. His father is never mentioned. In conversation, in other words, you, you keep that conversation going. You gain in it. In charity, that is to say love of the community, of your neighbors in spirit that is to say in the Holy Spirit let the unction and spiritual discernment come into you whereby you know what is right when you hear it and and uh, and what is wrong without uh, just it is just your ability with that spiritual discernment to know you can meet somebody and in five minutes you got them pretty well figured out you know because you can witness their spirit that spirit comes forth. And then plus that love in spirit. Test that spirit in faith. Always let your faith be strong. You can count on God. Everything he has ever said or taught has come to pass exactly as it's written. There's no ifs, ands, or maybes. It always comes to pass as the word says it will if you know how to read it. If you understand it. Therefore, God's not going to lead you down Primrose Lane. He's always going to take care of you. But what, what Paul is saying here, and, and you know, you remember back um, in a prior chapter, he said, um, it was verse 6 of chapter 3, not a novice. That means somebody that just comes into the Word and said, I'm going to start teaching. Well, you're not ready. But, but Timothy <clears throat> had at least seven years. And probably more than that, quite frankly, if the truth was known. He was 13 when Paul came by the first time, but I think Lois and Eunice probably had him going a long time before that. And then seven years later, he has studied. And it wouldn't be natural that many elders, when a 21-year-old came by and was teaching God's Word chapter by chapter and line by line, they're going to, they would maybe try to use his youth, but not his experience. You, you want to listen to what someone says, a man, woman, child, and you'll always learn something. What you learn may be, be hey, don't ever listen to that character again. And, and you, don't, you always check a man out, this man or any other man. What does the word say? That's what you go by is what God has to say. So don't let people judge you whether you're young, in between, or old. But do be ready. If you're going to start teaching, be prepared to teach. Well, many, You know, I get many letters will say, well, how, how can I tell when I'm ready to teach? I, I can tell you, it will be when people approach you, they get acquainted with you, and they know you have answers. And people will travel from far to get their questions answered, and they will ask you. And when you can answer those questions, then people want to hear you. And when people want to hear you, you're ready. Okay. God has blessed you. You have it. And nobody knows exactly what it is until you hear it. And you know whether it's of God or it's man. Okay. Man should never build a reputation for himself. First comes, 
Well, let's take this church as an example, Shepherd's Chapel. What does that mean? Well, there's one shepherd. It's Christ. He's the head. And people will say, well, how can I join your church? I don't, I don't talk to him. Talk to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the boss. And if he accepts you, wish you're going to, you're in. But he truly, he keeps all the church letters in heaven in the book of life. We don't keep church letters here at the chapel. They're, they're in heaven, right in the book of life. It's written down every day. If you do something wrong, it makes, it makes headlines there in the book of life. Or if you repent, it's erased and it goes away, never to be heard from again. Your good deeds, they kind of stack up there. And as we learn here in this book of Timothy before too long, in the... Um, 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, along about verse 8 or 9, good deeds cover a multitude of sins. We'll get that in the next book. Okay. So they kind of stay there, and, and God likes that. Okay. But there you have it, and how precious it is to be still. Don't let somebody judge you by what you are, your credentials or your ability. Uh, you know, you could have a list that long behind your name, DD of this and DD of that and BS of this and BS of that. and It means nothing. It's your ability. This is why Christ said, uh, you enter this and uh, if you do, I will tell you so and so. It was his ability. And so it is with you. When you're ready, you're ready and uh, never um, uh, let someone take advantage of your age to document what you know, let your word that you're teaching document that, and so it is. Um, okay, let's go with the next verse, please. Verse 13, and you, you keep that going, keep it pure, the impurity, don't, don't drag in any extra stuff. 13, till I come, give attendance to reading. That means publicly you read the Word and publicly and privately you study it, but read it out loud to the people. Well, read what, brother? The Word of God, of course. To exhortation, that means when somebody needs correction or ask a question that be able to exhort, that is to say, tell them how to get it done. To doctrine. And don't ever take on man's doctrine that makes void the Word of God. We have one doctrine, that is the doctrine of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the apostles and the prophets and those he sent. And, and, um, and, and so it is. What, uh, and um, God sends apostles. Well, what is an apostle? It's a sent one. That's what the word means. And certainly... Timothy was, and so was Paul. But stick to the doctrine of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 14, Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. In other words, uh, God gives gifts. and uh, Different gifts, different people. It's... Um, the word gift in the Greek many times is chariz. It's charisma. And people recognize that. But uh, don't neglect it. You know something? Meaning no gift is given by God that he's going to take back. If God gives a gift, it means that he has a purpose for you. And as it is written in Romans chapter 11, no gift is given with repentance. He's not going to take it away. He's going to straighten your case out until you get it right. And when you fall short. And that gift is still going to stand. It, it, will, it will come out. There's nothing you can do about it. If God gives you that gift of teaching or sharing truth or whatever, it's going to come out because it's God-given. And that is true charisma. Don't ever neglect the gift God gives you. Verse 15. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them. I mean, don't, don't just part way. That thy profiting may appear to all. 
And, and so it is. Your progress can be made known to everybody. They can see your progress of God bringing you forward. This word meditate, what does it mean? Well, the etymology of the word comes from could. It comes from a cow chewing her could, or a deer, or a clean animal. See, a cow has more stomach than one, and while the sun's out and they're chomping, they bring in that foliage, and then they go lay down somewhere, and they send that could down into that tummy, and up comes that could, and they chew it and chew it. They meditate on it. That's what he means. What you have taken in in the day, stop, think, meditate, chew that could, roll it over, consider it, think about it. What it really has to do is um, think for yourself. Don't let somebody else do your thinking. Do you know that's how you get tied up in cults? Is when when they do your thinking for you. When, when some group, if you join some group and they want to do all your thinking for you, instead of teaching you how to think for yourself, you you better be very careful, because you're in a cult. God wants you to be a free thinker, to think for yourself, to make your own decision. Do you know why? On Judgment Day, you're going to stand before Almighty God. There's not going to be some preacher or some church or something else between you and Him. You're going to answer for your actions. And it's none of this business of, well, I would have done it, but so-and-so said. No, He sent you a letter that you can read. And there, there are... There are, um, in God's way, understanding for handicapped and other people that are unable to. But he does it. Okay, one more verse here. Let's go um, with uh, verse 16. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. That's the teachings. Continue in them. You stay firm. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. In other words, you're going to save souls, and that's what Christ was in the business of, God's Savior. That's what Yeshua in the Hebrew tongue means. That's what Jesus in English means as Father's Savior. So there you have it. That's what the Word does. It builds you up. It gives you character. It gives you discipline. Without discipline, you're in a heap of hurt. You must discipline yourself in the Word. All right, we'll pick it up here in the next lecture. Don't miss it. Listen a moment, won't you please?